Um, so I, I'm gonna, I, I, I was really torn actually between giving like an actual talk and just roasting Sandy and Kristen the entire hour, because it sort of seems a little bit like that's like the right venue. It's almost like the long delayed wedding or something. And I'm like the best man giving the speech, but I decided not to do that. <laughs> but I, I have a couple of things. I am gonna spend a few minutes at the beginning talking about scientific philosophy, but, but I think it, it bears me reading a short paragraph. Um, so this is for the first grant I ever wrote in 2010 when I had just decided that I should quit residency. Um, the world of cancer research has only begun to welcome people with my background, the physical sciences, I'm a physicist. And I'm lucky enough to train an institution funded by the NCI to draw us in, Moffitt Cancer Center's Physical Science and Oncology Center. Here, I found an intellectual home. My mentors and colleagues share my enthusiasm for cancer research and we understand each other's language and methods. I'm able to play a unique role as I live in both the clinical and scientific world. I'm able to bring clinically relevant questions to the math modelers and biologists, and I'm able to understand their results and apply them to real patients. It's bridge bridging this gap between these two, world two worlds that drives my short and long-term goals. They funded that, um, and it's still the case. And so, thanks. Honestly, I'm, I'm here, and, and you'll see in a, a couple slides later, I'm, I'm not just here, but I'm here. I, I think that this, com this community and this scientific field uh, saved me in many ways. And can I maybe see my talk? Oh dear. I could just give you my computer. I can just, I'll just do some extemp, I'll just do some improv until then. Yeah, just roast them, exactly. Um, so yeah, I guess, well, what should I say? I mean, I think that, um, I don't know, I'm just gonna wait awkwardly. I could just bring it up on my. Hmm. It is a real honor, and I think that uh, you know many of this crowd has been together for a long time, and I think it's really fun. That, like Dan said, the evolution of this field is is really quite striking compared to the first PSOC meeting in 2010 in DC, um, where Chris McFarland and I met. Where's Chris? Uh, we were met both of us as first year PhD students in the back corner of a poster session. No one wanted to talk to either of us, so we just presented our posters to each other. And now here we are, um, still going at it. So I think what we're going to talk about today is, is I think I said, it's a talk broken into three parts. Um, the first third or so will be scientific philosophy and my, my overall lab's goals and dreams and desires. And then the middle part is going to be a, a sort of deep dive into an assay that we created, a tool, a, measure, a measurement tool to, to specifically parameterize a certain kind of mathematical model that we'll talk about. And then in the end, I'll sort of use that tool in anger, if you will. Um, you can please, anything you want to share that I'm talking about, you can. Everything's either published or pre-printed. And I also want to come out, uh, you can scan that QR code and it goes to our lab website. And then further, I want to just sort of open with a diversity and inclusion statement, which is really near and dear to my heart. Um, I think that without... Uh, embracing everyone of all types, colors, creeds, uh, ideas, we're weaker if we don't do that. And I think in our lab, especially, we, we strive to be inclusive and safe. And I think that uh, I'd like to do that here today as well and welcome anyone uh, to join us. I think it's not just something you say for grants. It's uh, the way we should all live. And then I'm going to try to figure out how to... Cool. So... Okay, so here's the next case you've probably all seen. And this is gonna be like a minute and a half of my background. So I, I started my life as a physicist. I, got, I went to the Naval Academy. Uh, I studied how, um, well, I studied astrophysics to be honest. But I sort of moved through life. After the Naval Academy, I moved to a submarine. They said, join the Navy, see the world. I learned how nuclear reactors work, how we can understand ensembles of random events in the case of fission. And, and, hand, and, and harness that for a mean field effect, which is hot water. Um, and then they said, you know, all the, I was excited to see the Bahamas and everything, but really all I saw in the Navy was a, a control room that looks something like this. Um, so after the Navy, I decided to, to go to medical school because that's what you'd normally do. Um, but as I joined radiation oncology as a field, I decided I wanted to use all this nuclear physics that I knew to help instead of destroy the world, which is a good idea. Um, but I got really, really, frustrated with the state of medicine. And I actually reached a really, really low point in my, my, old, my whole life. I, I was 28, 29 years old, maybe 30. I, had, I was actually quite deep in debt because I was in medical school. I had just gone to medical school and paid for it. And see, I hadn't yet paid my loans off. Um, 
And, and I was really struggling to figure out what I was doing with myself. I was at a top 10 cancer center at Moffitt Cancer Center. I was practicing radiation oncology, which is one of the most technically amazing fields on earth. I'm a pretty smart guy. I was surrounded by brilliant folks. I had no constraints on me. I could order any test I wanted. I could use any machine I wanted. I could do anything I wanted to any patient. And still, it was a coin flip as to whether I cured somebody. I couldn't really deal with that. That was really frustrating. And I started going lab to lab, trying to find a scientific place, a home that I could live in so I could tell my patients when I sat with them, honestly, that I was trying. Because when you sit with someone and they come to a top, you know, Moffitt Cancer Center is one of the best places in the world and they come to you and they're a young person, an old person, doesn't matter. They're putting their life in your hands. And they're like, well, you're the best, right? And you're like, <laughs> yeah. And then they say, but, but, but why is it just 50%? Why aren't you doing better than that? I couldn't look those folks in the eyes anymore. And I was really at a crisis in my life. And, and I, found, um, I found Sandy. <laughs> and, and he changed my whole life. Oh, that picture, sorry. Um, so that was one of many mornings he drove me to work uh, after I'd quit residency and started a PhD. And we were looking for, of course, for milk for the espresso machine. That really is what saved my life. Um, and so I think, you know, this really did change the way I think about the world. And through the lens of mathematical biology, I think I was truly saved. And more importantly, through this community. And so I want to say thank you to everyone for welcoming me. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you, Bob. Where are you? Thank you. Um, and thank you, Dan and the NCI. So I don't mean to be sappy, but I think really I am saved and I am who I am because of this community. So cheers. Thanks. Um, and you know, I think we now, I can now see the world. This was me last week at a meeting I planned months in advance in Germany. Um, so they say, join the Navy, see the world, but really it's join academia, see the world. And now we really have this incredible privilege to travel all over the world and talk about these ideas, right? Things we can draw on a napkin. But the ideas that we think have come up with here are so powerful that we can change the entire course of human history. But it's important, like, you know, here's this gorgeous place. It's important to remember that these people were audacious enough to allow us. So I wanted to say thanks. And also just to remember that we're not the first people that got to enjoy this landscape. Um, we are currently on Apache and um, many other tribal lands. So we, we should, we should uh, say thanks to those folks, or at least acknowledge that you, we didn't say please or thank you. Um, but I think that we're here, and it's a, it's a real privilege for us to be here, to share, to share our science together. Okay, that's the beginning. That's the end of the philosophy. Now we're going to move on to some um, overall scientific scope. And so I think that the, for me, I started out as a mathematical biologist, and I think I learned all these tools. But over the course of my training with Sandy and others, I really came to realize that the most important central focus should really be the evolutionary process. The number one and two causes of death on Earth, at least preventable death on Earth and humankind, are infections that escape our ability to control them with antibiotics and cancers that escape our ability to control them with therapies. This is a common mechanism here, which is evolution. And so focusing on this is where we're gonna go with the rest of the, my career and life probably. Um, but I think before we do the doom and gloom of the next slide, which everyone's seen about resistant cancers, I think it's important to recognize that we actually do cure most cancers with an inclined plane on the end of a stick, which is to say a knife. Um, and the ones that we don't cure with a knife, we can pretty much cure with radiation. But those that we can't, um, inevitably recur. And I think that this is just a little shot, this is a, um, a little advertisement for what we do in radiation oncology. It is an incredible technology. This is actually scans of a patient of mine um, named Chase, who's, who's passed away. Uh, he was 16 when he came to me with a tumor about the size of his heart, right next to his heart. He was told he had six weeks to live. And with technology and a little bit of um, swinging for the fences together, he lived a couple of years, he got married, had some good times. But he died eventually because I was unable to save him. Um, you know, we can do incredible, incredible things. We can put radiation deep inside people's bodies. We can take images. But at the end of the day, patients die of their disease because we lose control. And I think that everyone's, and this audience has probably seen this slide, but I think that this understanding that the failure of our amazing therapies is a conserved phenomenon that happens across all the kingdoms of life. Um, there's a, this is all that is stolen directly from Bob when I first started, really opened my eyes to the idea that as a physicist, this, these are the fundamental principles that drive preventable death. 
And so if we can, instead of focusing so hard on the individual solutions that evolution comes up with, we can instead focus on the mechanism by which, the evolutionary mechanisms by which it solves the problem of our therapies, I think that we'll be in better shape. <clears throat> So I think everyone's probably seen this idea, and we're going to focus on this concept of adaptive therapy that I really think we owe Bob Gatenby an enormous debt of gratitude for bringing to the fore, um, and also for paying for my PhD, so cheers. Um, so I think we'll, for the rest of the talk, we're sort of going to think about this concept of the difference between a maximum tolerated dose and adaptive therapy that I think is probably um, most people are comfortable with. Okay, um, this is our laboratory. It's just a little advertisement. If, we, if you want to come work with us, we'd love to have you. Um, as, a, as a physicist and an engineer or whatever the heck I am, we're really not focused on any one tool. We're focused instead on the questions. And I think that's the important thing for us as scientists. And I think coming out of mathematical biology and becoming oncologists as we are as a community, we need to focus on the important questions and use whatever tool comes to bear. So in our laboratory, you know, most people think I'm a doctor who does math, I must do um, informatics. Well, we do if it's the right tool to use. Um, but at the same time, if you want to study evolution, sometimes you might just do it in bacteria. So I think that we're going to focus on the questions today, not the tools. So you'll see a bunch of different tools used. Um, and I think it'd be fun for everyone to think about. Um, and, and I want to sort of frame the entire question or the entire talk in terms of the evolutionary timescales over which diseases, in specifically cancer today, progresses. So as a physician and a scientist, I have every day a ton of cognitive dissonance because when I walk into a patient room, they really don't care about mathematical biology or cancer evolution or any of this. They just want to know how they can be helped today. As a scientist, it's quite boring to think about evidence-based medicine, right? So I get a patient who comes in with stage three sarcoma. I look it up in a book what to do. That's not very satisfying, having worked 47 years of my life to be an expert. So as a scientist, I really want to think about these processes by which the cancer arises and so on and so forth. But they don't care. You know what also patients don't want to hear? Is they, they don't want to hear, I don't know, right? So if you say like, well, why is my cancer failing this therapy? The real answer is, I don't know. They don't want to hear that because they want confidence, they want to understand, they want to, they're putting their life in their hand. And so this dissonance really fuels everything I do, but it also makes me a little crazy. Um, and I want to sort of focus on the way we normally think about, or I should say not we, but the, the sort of field in general, normally focus on this one moment in time, right? There's this beautiful evolutionary process playing out from the beginning of a single clone, the process of heterogeneity and speciation, which we'll talk about, and, and, and that you get a tumor ecosystem at the end, and we're going to go into that. But really, cancer therapy, oncology today, we have one moment in time. That moment we stick a needle into the patient, and we pull it out, and we look at it. And we boil this entire little microcosm, this entire evolutionary world down to one moment. And what do we look for? Well, we look for the things we know how to look for, right? We look for the mutations that we're expecting. We look for the things that we can target. But at the end of the day, there's this entire beautiful process that's led up to this that we're generally ignoring in the clinic. And so I, I would argue that in, instead, we should be thinking about this entire evolutionary continuum, again, starting with a single clone. And in our laboratory, we think about all these things at different scales. And I'll go through each one, each one of them just briefly to give you a flavor. And then we'll sort of focus in on where we're going to talk today, which is this idea of the interspecies competition in the middle. So we're going to think about cancer and infections, the, the two biggest causes of death. Uh, preventable death on earth as complex adaptive systems. Thanks for those words, Bob. And that change and adapt and evolve over multiple timescales. And each of those timescales requires its own strategy, just to, not just to think about, but also to treat. And I think we're moving into a world where we can start to intervene in each of those timescales in a different way. So, okay, something I'm not going to talk about much today, but I want to give you an idea. So there's Rowan. What are you talking about while you're here, Rowan? This stuff? Cool. <laughs> Rowan will talk about this stuff. Um, so thinking about what I call the, the longest time scale, the evolutionary time scale, I'll term it for this talk, this idea of speciation events. How do new mutations arise? How do they fix? What, how, is there, how does that process work? So we think about things like fitness landscapes, and you'll hear more about that. We have a couple of PhD students working on this as well, thinking about how these things progress through time. Um, in this intermediate time scale, which I'm going to call the ecological time scale for the purposes of this talk, we think about how the existing heterogeneity works together or against itself. How, that energy, how is that interplay affecting response to therapy, tumor growth, overall dynamics? It is absolutely such a thing that these things compete and interact. 
And then of course, there's the, what I call the shortest or clinical time scale we work on as well. Um, Christy, are you talking about this? Is your poster about this? Yes, Christy's poster last night was about this short time scale where we really ask, okay, we have the information now, what can evolution teach us about how to treat, right? So if we take this idea of convergent evolution, we have this beautiful heterogeneity in the middle with millions of, upon millions of genotypes in a tumor. What can I boil that down to to do something today? Um, and so we think about that a lot in terms of gene signatures and some other methods using data science and the ideas of convergent evolution to think about what to do um, and for both therapy, uh, chemo and radiation therapy. Okay. That's the end of the beginning. So the rest of the talk, we're gonna focus on this ecological timescale and talk about some of the science. Um, if anyone has any questions or wants to talk about any of the other stuff, you can ask it now or just jump in. I like being interrupted. ADHD makes it easier that way. Um, uh, and if not, I'll just plow on. So I think um, this idea of an ecological timescale in the middle, and I wanna give credit to a lot of folks who've worked on this. So Jeff Maltis was supposed to give the next talk, but was unable because of family reasons. He did a lot of the experiments I'm gonna show today, as did Nina who's an amazing technologist who's about to become a PhD student in our lab, who actually did a stint at Moffat as well um, and worked with Bob and Sandy over a summer. And then Nathan Farokian, who's one of the ones who got away, he decided to be a head and neck surgeon instead of an oncologist, although there's cancers up there. Uh, and then uh, a, a student of mine called Artem Kosnachev, who's now in Utrecht and he's hiring PhD students if people are interested in going to the Netherlands, lovely country. Um, and I think what we're gonna talk about for the rest of this talk is largely driven by experiments done by these folks. So we're gonna ask the question, how does the interaction between members of a standing heterogeneous population affect overall fitness of a population and drug response? Right, so this is a slide I saw from Sandy 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Um, and what's really crazy about this slide, I think everyone looks in this like, yeah, 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 Nature Reviews Cancer 2012, whatever, right? We all know this, it's all cancer is heterogeneous, of course. But when I started in clinical medicine in 2009, this was not obvious. And I'd say even today, many oncologists, this is not obvious to them. Honestly, the textbooks I have, radiation oncology textbooks, look like masses of cells that are all the same in little spheres. That's how we think of tumors, right? I think this audience, at least, is much more enlightened. And we now realize that tumors are not just collections of mutated cells, but instead they're these beautiful, dare I say, <laughs> interacting ecosystems of many, many, many different types and things. Um, and the good news is that smart people have been working on problems like this for a long time. So the theoretical ecologists in particular have been working on this for hundreds of years with systems of coupled ODEs, a number of different mathematical tools, some of which we're going to talk about today. Um, and in particular, I think a really important point here is that you can actually control the important parts of complex ecosystems without knowing everything. And that's a really key point, right? So let's take, for example, here's a beautiful paper of Bob's from a long time ago. Thank you, Bob. And on the right, let's just look at that cartoon of wolves and moose and talk about that for one second. So now let's say I'm a game reserve managing person. And I'm really interested in making sure that neither the wolves nor the moose go extinct, right? I don't have to know how many brown shelled four legged beetles are in that ecosystem. I don't have to know how many different species of maize there are. I can control those two populations just by knowing a little bit. Right? So the question is, is how much do I need to know to get the amount of control I want? And I think we're going to keep that in mind because we're going to try to control the evolution of a cancer with as little information as we can, because there's no way I'm going to measure everything, right? There's no way that any mathematical model can capture all the heterogeneity that's in there. There's no way that I can sample the whole thing. My needle's going on the left. What about the right? There's no way I'll know it all. So I ask the question, how little can we know to control something? And I would argue further that in this ecological time scale, we don't actually have to know much about or anything about genetics. So let's think, let's do the thought experiment of an, a, a game reserve where I have wolves and moose. And let's say they're isogenic, these two populations. You don't need mutations in either type for the frequencies to change. And I would argue, let's say you have one moose and 40,000 wolves. Can anyone tell me what the absorbing steady state of that population is gonna be? It's gonna be dinner for like three minutes, and then there's gonna be no wolf, moose anymore, right? And sort of the opposite is true as well. Depending on how many of these, each of these species you have, you can have massive fluctuations in individual population dynamics without any genetic change. You don't need some new wolf species to come in and be stronger and better at eating moose. You don't need some new moose species that's faster at getting away. You simply need to have differential population densities in different places. It's frequency dependence. And so I think that this concept is one that we're gonna to try to harness 
going forward in the rest of this talk. And I really want to blame David. I mean, thank David um, for a paper that I consider to be like my gateway drug. So you know how when you're 12 and you start smoking cigarettes? No, sorry. You know how, um, so anyways, there I was in residency and I came across this group. And the reason I came across IMOs truly is because I was really broke and their lab was like 50 meters past Starbucks and they had an espresso machine. So I could choose every day whether I wanted to spend five bucks or walk 50 extra meters and get free espresso. So I started getting free espresso and started talking to this guy, David Basanta. Next thing you know, the tax for getting the coffee is you got to talk to David. Um, and he pulls you into these conversations. And this is really the first paper that I participated in. And shortly after this uh, authorship, I quit residency. Thanks, David. Um, and I don't want anyone to concentrate on, on the numbers or on the, the equations, but I want you to concentrate on the questions that we could ask, right? Don't worry about the tool. What kind of questions can we ask? And this is really, I think, the first paper where a game theory model, which is what this is. Do I have a um, pointer on this thing? Maybe not. Um, a game theory model, we can start asking questions about therapy. And this is really one of the first times a treatment idea was woven into a model of this type. So this is a model of prostate cancer. And in this one, we asked a couple of different questions. We asked, what happens if you intervene early or later? So in this cartoon, you can see when blue is on, that's treatment of some kind. And you can see that intervening earlier in the same exact dynamic makes blue lose. If you intervene later, blue wins. Maybe it's culling wolves too early and all of a sudden, or sorry, moose too early and all of a sudden their population crashes because you didn't help them go enough. We could also ask how long you treat. So the same therapy given at exactly the same time, but for a different duration. That can even qualitatively change these outcomes. Really, so you can ask questions like, when should you treat? How long should you treat? But it all boils down to what you put in the model. Right? So this is any mathematician in the crowd realizes that those uh, Greek letters are just hiding constants. Well, I didn't tell you that. Now I did. Those Greek letters are just hiding constants. And whatever number you put in there will give you deterministically the outcomes. So it's really not a surprise. But at the same time, this concept that you could use a model like this to study these questions was powerful. Uh, moving forward, starting to work with Artem, we, we thought of a similar thing, David and I. Um, and we asked a different question. We said, in what order do we treat? What if we give drugs A, B, and C, and then drugs A, C, and B instead? Well, you get massively different evolutionary outcomes. Again, it's not surprising mathematically, but it's not intuitive clinically. Oh, I have three drugs. I can give them whatever order. Up to date says I can do whatever I like, right? But these are different things. But again, it boils down to what you put in model, right? This is a different way to write down a similar kind of competition model. Um, and the real question is, you know, does any of this matter? Is this us just faffing around with equations? But I think that we're very lucky to be in the room with some folks who are audacious enough, again, thanks, Bob, to put some of these questions really to the, to the test in the form of a clinical trial. And I think the answer of does any of this matter is a resounding yes. So I think that there's a huge, important, meaningful kernel of truth underlying all of these models that will allow us with some measurements to understand and control maybe the ecologies that are inside our patients. So in this, this is a paper probably this group knows, but uh, again, it sort of boils down to what you write down the dynamics. And I'm gonna steal some of Kristen's words here. You know, in this case, each man had a single equation. In this case, it was all men because it was a prostate cancer paper, um, looking at metastatic cash rate versus in prostate cancer and whether or not you wanna give abiraterone on and off with Lupron in the background. But uh, the question here boils down to what the individual dynamics look like. And if you look in the paper, which is gorgeous, you can see that each, each patient really did have very different ecological dynamics. Luckily, the heuristic of the model captured enough of the truth for it to matter for their clinical outcome. So I think this is all very exciting. Um, and what we really did after this paper was paused. And so this is uh, a picture of Andre just there and David, and then a student called Jeff Peacock, who's attending Radonk now in Alabama, and then Artem again. And after this paper, I think we really sat down and were really motivated to ask the question, how can we measure the heart of that model, right? We've done all this beautiful theory. We thought really hard about if we know what's in the model, we can do all this cool stuff, ask these questions, design clinical trials, but how do we know what's sitting in there? So can we design an assay directly measure that game being played? So we sat down and, and we did the sort of simplest thing you can. We asked about two species, wolves and moose. We designed an assay in a specific kind of non-small cell lung cancer, uh, which has a specific genetic aberration called ALK and ALK tra uh, 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 fusion. Uh, it doesn't really matter, honestly, 
But the idea here is that we have sensitive and resistant, and we have sensitive sensitivity to a specific drug. In this case of this, like I'm saying, it's a specific kind of lung cancer. What we did was we evolved resistance in one strain, which we bought off the shelf to a specific drug called electinib, and then we had a sensitive and resistant strain. So we had a, a tumor that was a mixture, we can mix it however we like, and we started asking the question, how do these things interact and can we measure it? So let's go back to what this sort of model looks like at its heart. So in the simplest way of looking at a two strategy game, or sorry, two player game, Arnold Charlson just ripped me for the saying strategy, it's player. Um, the simplest case of a two player game, we have type P parental and type R resistant. And the question is how they interact. So each of the entries in that matrix, the A, B, C, and D, give us some sense of the interaction. So A and D are what we call type fitness. So A is how parental acts when it's just by itself. And D is how resistant acts when it's by itself. And then B and C are this interaction terms of how they work together. There's lots of different ways you can write down these formulations, but we're gonna think about this simple idea of a replicator equation. And what we're gonna try to do is design an assay so that we can pull out those A's, B's, C's, and D's. Because remember, in all those fun modeling papers I showed you, that was the heart of the model that we needed. So to do this, we took these cells that we designed, we engineered, actually we didn't engineer them, we evolved them, and we started doing the, the simple thing, right? So let's measure their growth rates. So this is, we're gonna have two different conditions. It's almost gonna be like summer and winter. We have two species, red and green, parental and resistant, and we're gonna have two seasons with and without fibroblasts. So in this case, we have DMSO, which is no drugs, so it's just a vehicle control, growth rate's the same. Uh, and it's interesting, and we'll come back to that because there's no cost of resistance here. Um, and then when there's fibroblasts around, no change. But when you add drug, of course, you get a crash in the sensitive population. Makes sense. We give a drug that's targeted to them. And then when you add fibroblasts back into the mix, you can see the parental growth rate goes back up above zero. This is a known um, behavior where fibroblasts can rescue different um, therapeutic things. So I think it's probably the first time it's shown in this cell line, but it's not a new response. So again, this is interesting, but, and we'll come back to this no cost of resistance in a little bit. Um, so the first thing you might do is just grow them together and see how they interact. Well, you can see that when you add drug, all of a sudden the sensitive ones die out and the resistant ones grow, but that's not good enough because we need numbers. So let's design a quick algorithm to count them. And what we'll do is we'll now plot the number of each of these things over a long period of time. So obviously if you add drug, the sensitive ones die. So their number, the red ones numbers go down and the green ones numbers go up because they don't care. But what we need is a function, right? So actually it fits quite beautifully to a simple exponential. And what we have here is a positive growth rate for the resistant and a negative growth rate for the sensitive, makes sense. But now we can write down exactly what these growth rates are. So we put this into a larger axis. You can see the, um, the, or the origin there, there's a major axis, a minor axis, and you can see that we're in the upper left-hand corner with this result. So the parental is dying negative and the sensitive is growing positive. If you change conditions, so now this is with no drug, everyone's growing, right? This is a, the monoculture results I showed you, they're quite obvious. But what's beautiful is if you start mixing them in different frequencies, you get massive changes in the quantitative and qualitative growth behaviors. So not only with drug do we have sensitive dying and resistant growing, but across the spectrum of different frequencies. So now all of a sudden each of these squares or circles, the opacity is the initial density I seeded them at. So the very, very light is one wolf and a thousand moose. Very, very dark is one moose and a thousand wolves. What you can see is while their qualitative mean field behavior behaves as you'd expect, which is to say drug, parental dying, sensitive living. Sorry, strike that, reverse it. Go ahead, Jonah. You said you want to interrupt, right? Yeah, interrupt. You didn't interrupt, you raised your hand though. You could do, and we have the spatial data such that it could be done. Um, and the, this assay is a five-day assay, so we assume we, we initially uh, plate very sparsely. We sort of make the simplifying assumption that the frequency to start with is, is the same as the frequency at the end. But I agree with you, clearly during the course of the assay, stuff's happening, right? And we don't really consider that for this first pass. But yeah, you could. And we have those data, and I happily share them. Please. Um, I would say no. I'd say modeling on the basis of phenotype. So, they started as the same type. So they started, I bought, I bought one cell line in the store, 
and then I took two aliquots and one of them I let sit and drug for four months. Yes, yes. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. There's a whole beautiful ecosystem, right? Well, I think the answer is we don't know yet. I think very clearly it is a model system, right? And I think based on the sort of hopes I have of fishery management and game reserves, there is an idea that you can control the important populations with a minimum of knowledge, ignoring a lot of stuff. It's not perfect, of course. And I think based on you know, the clinical trials that we've seen from Moffitt, there's a, there's, a, there's a hint of hope there, but obviously we're far away, right? So this is in vitro with two things that are two colors. This is like the most boring thing you could do. But even with the most boring thing you could do, there's a hint that there's some veracity to the underlying assumptions of the model. And then the question then is, what, what do you do with that, right? And, and um, I think what we do with that is, is a lot more work. So um, the PSON just uh, funded Andre and I after our ninth submission of the same grant. <laughs> no, I'm not bitter about that. Um, to move this assay in vivo. And so I'll come to the end. We haven't done it yet. But I, I agree with you that this is like as, as stupid a model as it could be. No, no, I am. No, 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 it, as simple, as simple, right? Oh. Oh, no, this is. I can, well, we, I, we can talk later, but I think, I think your question's a good one, right? Like, but, but I guess that same question can be reflected back and be like, why do we do anything in a dish, right? So, so I guess at, at some point, those same, those same limitations, right? Well, I mean, but you know, we, we, do, those, we do those things because we can, yeah. But the whole point of the paper is to agree with that fundamental observation to say that when you have other cells present with the cancer cells, it's changing the dynamics of the thing. It's a simple model of the broader complex issue that, that you were bringing up. So this is not to say that what happened in this experiment is a full representation of what happens in a human, but a simple model to illustrate a concept which is relevant to the situation in humans. That's what I meant to say. <laughs> um, but, but I agree with you. And I think what, we're, what, I'm, what I'm trying to show here is I think the first hint that we can measure this and, and quantify it in a way that works with a model. So that, because without a model, you know, what goes up must come down doesn't get us SpaceX, right? We need quantitative models to help us do important things like prediction and control. And before this, I think um, we didn't have that. So what we can show now is sort of, if you blow up those data, each of those squares with different opacities is actually a, a pair of points. And what we can do is actually pick off the intercepts and pull out the heart of that model. And I think that's really the key part of this paper is that we're able to really now directly measure in a very simple system, the specific cell-cell interaction and the quantitative effects on that on overall heterogeneous population growth. Um, and sort of like an overall phenotype, if you will. And what's interesting, if you look at the different four experimental conditions, which are with and without fibroblasts, summer, winter, if you will, and with and without drug, um, you sort of have this natural behavior where fibroblasts, the change of season, if you will, shifts the game quantitative, qualitatively in the same way, and drugs shift it in a different way. So what I'd like to leave the audience with after this part of the talk is the idea that, you know, can we think of drugs as instead of things that kill stuff, can we think of drugs as environmental modulators they really change the interactions that are occurring in front of us. Of course, they do kill stuff too, but what if we change the, uh, reframe our thinking to go in this way? So can we think of drugs in this new way to steer evolution? That's the question that's open. Um, 
So, okay, that was a super simple system in one cancer cell line with one muta mutation, with one drug. Does that mean, did we just get lucky? Well, I think we did get lucky. We found a cool game. If we had not found one, we might've given up, but we found something interesting. So the next question I ask is, is this generalizable in any way? So of course we took a huge risk. And what we did was we moved on to an exact same thing except for a different mutation. So we used non-small cell lung cancer and we evolved EGFR positive cells to give fit in it. So this question is, is it generalizable in any way, shape or form? So we take one step further. And so we did a couple of things in the pipeline, but we really improved the same paper, or sorry, we improved this method uh, by counting nuclei instead of um, cell area and a few other things. Uh, and this is a little shout out for preprints. This sat on the um, bioarchive for a year and a half before it was subsequently published in a nice journal. So you know, you're not gonna get scooped. It's very well, it's an, a great place to get your science out quickly. Um, and what I'm gonna show you is uh, just a couple quick results using this assay. Now that we have this tool, what kind of questions can we ask? Because again, it's questions, not tools, right? Here's a new tool, here's a hammer, go hit stuff with it. So let's hit some stuff. Um, so this is just an assay, a refresher about how this works. We plot, plot cells in different densities, we measure their growth rates, we fit a model equation, we can ask questions about this. So what's pretty neat, before I showed you drug and no drug, what about different amounts of drug? Clearly, if I give more or less drug, things should be different, right? And indeed, we do see a wide variation in ecological dynamics based solely on the, the amount of the drug given. So it's not just you give a high dose or a low dose, it's that you can give all different ranges of them. Um, what's really interesting here, if you think about it, is the first, and this is also a series of different drugs, you can look and you can see lipatinib as you give the drug, it actually rotates through three different quadrants. And each of these quadrants is a different fundamental evolutionary dynamic, going from all extinction in one direction to extinction in the other direction, coexistence. So we really have the panoply of evolutionary outcomes right here in front of us. And now for the pharmacokineticist in the audience, what happens when you take a pill? It actually goes from zero up to a maximum and then back down to zero. And what's actually happening in your tissue is the evolutionary dynamics are modulating over time. You're just, you're cycling through who you're, who you're behaving or who you're favoring. This is a scary thought, right? Because all of a sudden we think we're giving a drug and we're doing a thing, but we're actually doing a whole bunch of different things. The environment is being modulated in many different ways. It's important. Um, and so this exciting idea is hiding right here is this last. So um, Sandy, is this seven minutes about right? Or what, what's my time like? Can I, have, can I have 10? Yeah. Okay, so this is the last uh, exciting thing I'll show you with this tool. So, so here, this is data I just showed you a second ago, the differential doses of gefitinib, but hiding in plain sight is this really cool evidence for this idea called competitive exclusion. And so this is something that um, Bob and others have been talking about for years. And the idea is that if one type can exclude the other, this is actually like really a sine qua non for this concept of adaptive therapy. So that for adaptive therapy to work, you need to have a sensitive population that outcompetes the other type, right? You need to be able to move from one quadrant on this graph to the other. Because when you give the drug and you're in the lower right quadrant, all the sensitive are going to go extinct. And then you have this uh, just so story that we tell that the sensitive go extinct, resistant grow out, patient dies. However, here is evidence suggesting that when you pull the drug off, you can actually resensitize the tumor. This has been a putative idea for many years, but I think this is the evidence that we've been looking for to show that it really, at least in this kind of lung cancer, plays true. And so what, what's exciting about this? So here, here if, you, if you just measure on the left, um, the sort of standard assay you'd do in the dish, you'd take the parental cells, the blue ones, and measure their growth rate. It's really high. You measure the resistant cells. It's really low. Now, in this case, there is a cost to resistance, mind you. Um, what you'd guess, so what would you guess if you co-culture those without any of this knowledge previously, you'd guess the sensitive one would just outgrow everything, right? And so you'd think, you'd think that the, the resistant would never be around. So this sets up a huge paradox, right? So all of a sudden, if you have this idea of a cost, costly resistance mutation, which I think a lot of us hold dear, and you have that in a heterogeneous population, if you have a very, very weak, low fitness resistant mutation waiting for drug to come around, but there's no drug, what's gonna to happen to that mutation? It should just get outcompeted and go away, right? It has a much lower fitness, it should be outcompeted. But we hold this in our minds as like sort of the, one of the prevailing method, mechanisms of resistance. There's obviously also the concept of, of acquired resistance, which Andre and I have worked on and many others have, but I think that there's a tension here and, and there's tons of evidence to suggest that pre-existing mutations do exist, pre-existing resistant mutations, pre-existing costly resistant mutations. So how can this be? Um, and this isn't just cancer, right? This exists in HIV. So here's data to suggest that more mutations against the drugs of interest confer 
fitness decreases. Um, this happens, here's data from our lab in bacteria. The more mutations you have in E. coli against the beta-lactamase, the weaker it is in, uh, without the beta-lactamase. Here it is in Enterobacter. This is data from Ishan and, and Jeff in my lab. They're the same thing. If you evolve resistance, the more mutations, the weaker they are, the more fitness, the more deleterious that is in the, in the absence of the drug. So how can that be? So this ubiquitous but not omnipresent thing is, is, is the exciting thing. And the paradox here is how can those pre-exist? And so I'm going to propose an ecological solution, and we're going to test that in, in a different way. So what if we take the same experimental setup we had before? What you notice here is actually, so, so what does that look like? What does the tumor look like in your body? These are 10 million cells. No, sorry, that's way too small. One million cells. Um, 10 to the 12 cells. And how many resistant cells do there need to be? Not very many, right? So let's say there's 10 to the third. What does that look like on this graph? So the initial proportion of sensitive is gonna be almost one, right? Cause you're gonna have 10 to the 12th sensitive and 10 to the 10th say resistant. So 1% or less. So if you were just to measure their fitnesses straight off the bat, you'd think that the resistant ones are super weak, right? You'd, you'd measure that red dot on the left. That's the fitness of the resistant in monoculture. But all of a sudden when you culture them together, you have a scenario where the fit, the weak, the weak Mutation, mutated um, resistant cells are actually rescued by the sensitive. So you have this amelioration of their fitness de defect by the presence of the sensitive cells. This only happens at tiny proportions. The minute that starts growing out at all, the fitness decrease kicks in. So what we have is this large cost of resistance, but it's ameliorated entirely by the presence of a healthy tumor. So but at diagnosis, you can actually have persistence way longer. So here's the hypothesis we wanna set up. So it's at this cartoon on the right, Assuming that there's no games around, any mutation that arises that has a deleterious effect on fitness should come in and out of the population, should pop in, pop out, right? It, it, it arises randomly because mutation is, is random, but then it can't compete and it gets outcompeted. However, if we have this distribution of game effects, we actually should start seeing cells hang out longer based on their ecological effect itself. So what we're going to do is set up a, a simulation. On the left, you have this idea of an intrinsic fitness. This is sort of the y-axis of where you intercept. And then you have this differential ecological interaction. So if you have a negative eco-interaction, you're blue. And you can see those hardly bip, blip in and out of the population at all because they're actually beat down by the sensitive. But you also have these possibilities where it's the same intrinsic fitness, the same growth rate, but the ecological effect based on what's around ameliorates the population. So this is the question. So we're going to set up a quick simulation to make this argument and then show some experiments that I think validate it. So here's a, a simulation for 500. This is a right Fisher stochastic simulation. You have 500 generations. And what you don't see in that black is the teeny, teeny, tiny, less than 1% of things on the very, very bottom that are actually popping in and out and going extinct. And then at time step 500, we turn on a drug. So all of a sudden that fitness defect is now a massive increase, right? Because you have the resistance mutation. And what you want to do is look and see what are those mutations that are arising. And so this is on the bottom, it's just the frequency of all the mutations that exist, which is again, a teeny tiny population. And what you're seeing, if you're, we're drawing uniformly at random the eco effect, what we're seeing is the ones that persist are the ones of that positive interaction. Um, and if you look at it across many generations, you can start seeing this is now zooming in on the bottom half or 1%. You can see more and more of this benefit comes depending on whether you have games, quote unquote, on or off. And so what we're looking at is this sort of conserved effect where we think that the, the proportion of these cells that are existing beforehand are propped up by ecology. So that's a great theoretical example based on one experiment. What, does this hold true in any other scenario? So some of these are beautiful experiments done by Dagim. Thanks, Dog. Um, let's look at clinically observed resistance mutations. So now these are patients who have stage four non-small cell lung cancer who take a drug called osimertinib, which is first line in the metastatic setting. And these are patients who now that drug has failed and their cancer is returned. What resistance mutations do we see clinically? Well, half of them, we don't see anything. This is that gray part there, which we're gonna ignore, which is really the elephant in the room. But the other half are these sort of known pathways. So we have a bunch listed here. And if we go and actually engineer in these mutations, so Dogim has pain, painstakingly done this over the course of the last two years, not putting in, transfecting in KRAS, transfecting in PI3 kinase, transfecting in BRAF, and then measuring the games between those costly resistant mutants and their sensitive ancestors. And in all cases, we see this qualitative behavior. So in every, and then in the bottom, this is the uh, evolved strain that I showed you before. And it does take up the other entire part of the wheel. So what we're really seeing is for every single class of observed mutations that we see clinically, 
we see this ecological behavior. So what I think is exciting about this to me is the opportunity to think again about treating the ecology itself before we move on to treating the cancer, right? Is there a way that we can modify or turn off this effect, right? Can we go back to this and turn these games off and get these mutations to go, go away before we treat? And that's sort of the open question that I would leave the audience with. So I think that in this case, at least this nice preprint, we've kind of tested this question. And I think we've shown pretty strong evidence for these ecological effects being um, one way that um, lower fitness resistant cells could, could maintain their population in an otherwise compact and expanding population, which Jonah's going to tell us an alternative hypothesis about tomorrow, but I'll be gone. Um, and I think, it, it, again, this is a work from Jeff Maltus, who's on the job market, if you're hiring for faculty. Um, and I wanted to just remind everyone, I think that I think that here we have a lot of beautiful evidence for very simple but still uh, meaningful ecologies happening right in, a, in the most simple situation in a dish. And obviously, if they're happening in the dish, they're going to happen in animals and in us. Um, we were just, uh, like I said, thank you, the NCI, for funding a, a move to move this toward uh, an in vivo model. And like you saw before, I had fibroblasts in and out. Well, that's not just fibroblasts in those tumors, right? So what if we do these experiments with T cells on and off? What if we add in slowly that beautiful ecology? I think that's what I wanted to say. And the rest is thanks. That was a really great talk. Thanks. Very interesting. So um, it occurs to me that you could model you could use the same model to look at stem cell, non-stem cell components in a tumor where you're not dealing with the acquisition of a mutation. You're looking at intrinsic biology of slowly cycling versus rapidly cycling cells. Um, and that's present in virtually all, at least solid tumors, probably in liquid tumors as well. Um, and so I'm wondering, have you or anybody else applied this model to that just fundamentally intrinsic resistance mechanism that does not require any drug to be present and would require a completely different approach to eradicating prior to treatment of the rapidly dividing cells? Yeah, great question. So, you know, I think the mathematics are agnostic to the acquisition of mutation. It's two types. And so absolutely these conceptual ideas can be applied. I, I know for sure we've thought about STEM games in some chapter of my thesis I never wrote um, <laughs> or never wrote anywhere meaningful besides on a piece of paper. Um, I, I don't know if anyone's published a specific STEM game, but I know certainly it, it's been, we, we've imagined it. Um, and it's certainly an interesting idea. Like, you know, does the sort of standing heterogeneity, because I think there's a bunch of beautiful papers that show you can recapitulate a tumor from a few stem cells. And then if you wait long enough, it'll go back to the same proportion that it was in the bulk, right? You can purify the stem cells and get 90, 10 That's again, right. or whatever it is, right? So yeah, and one of the interesting things about that is rather than having two different populations of cells where you're saying they're interacting in a way that's controlling, um, you have a single lineage. You don't need any additional mutation. The relationship yeah. between the stem cell and the rapidly dividing cells is a completely different kind of relationship compared to competition between populations, right? They're not competing. Can you put that back up, please? You talk? I just wanted to show you. I, I completely agree. I was trying to pull up a yeah. slide just to give an idea of you know, how one might, wait, can I have the mouse? Okay, cool. Wait, am I doing this? Am I here? So I think, you know, an interesting thing that you'd bring up is, is a simple way to modify this. And it's important, right? Because in this model, you're sort of assuming the baseline assumption here is that each type is its own type and stays that way. Um, obviously in real life, these Rs were Ps a long time ago before I did the evolution experiment. So even on the time scale of the experiment, there's probably some mutation from type to type. And in the STEM game, if you will, it's not mutation, but it's phenotypic drift or, or shift, right? So what you can do is, is like mathematically, it's quite simple to sort of put, put a term in the top one that makes bottom ones and put a term in the bottom one that makes top ones. So there's certainly formalisms that allow you to do that, but I, I think it'd be a lot of fun to do. You'd need to do it uh, experimentally, you'd need reporter systems that were robust enough for the change, uh, but I'm sure those exist. Thank you. Hey, Jake. Here. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering, uh, did you sort of, obviously, I think if you found the answer as to why these resistant cells are being propped up by the sensitive cells, right, that would be coming somewhere at the end of your talk. So it's probably speculation at this point, but I'm curious what you've found yeah. and not found about that and where, where things are about that question. Thanks, Rafael. A great question. So he's asking sort of what's the mechanism of this ecological boost. And so I would argue a couple of things. I think that 
that there's a huge can of worms there and we're absolutely, we have not found the answer. Um, otherwise I would have showed you. Um, but, but I think uh, Andre did some experiments in our initial work that suggested hepatocyte growth factor was um, one thing that helped the sensitive prop up the others. But, but I would argue that in almost every case, it's probably different, right? It's not gonna be, oh, the ecology is HGF, right? And the scary thing to me is if I showed you one evolution experiment, sorry, two, one with Alkin, one with EGFR, right? If I did, like maybe one of my postdocs wanted to do this, would be a great idea, Maxi. If you did like a hundred different evolution experiments, you, you might get a hundred different answers, right? My hope would be that you'd get some sort of representable ensemble that you could then use as like a formal distribution for later, but but it, it could be that that's an uncountable number of things, and I don't know. Um, so obviously, not obviously, but we are working to do hard experiments to figure out what what what's in the juice. Um, is it a contact thing? Is it a secreted thing? I have no idea. Um, and I think you know you look across the kingdoms of life, and there's like a million ways you can do this. Some E. coli chew the drug up for their resistant friends. Some E. coli pull it in. Some cancer cells probably do all these different things as well. So the answer is. I don't know. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Really fun. Uh, so I haven't fully thought this through, so it might be a stupid question, but in your game, so you have the different cell populations. You can have two, you can have three. What about the environment itself as a player? Because we know that the environment evolves with the population in its own way, right? So, what? Uh, yeah, well, can you add actually the environment as a player in the whole thing itself, like a separate entity, right? Which is now modifying all yes. of these different behaviors. So, so, so yeah. mathematically, there's a few ways to do that. The theoretical ecologists have these seasonal models where you can say winter, summer, for example. Uh -huh. So same species, different environment. Oh, yeah. So that's one way to mathematically do it. And, and actually, if you looked at the very first slide, we actually kind of initially wanted to do... Oh, this is like upside down. That's why I'm having problems. So exactly. So so trying to do some condition media experiments to figure out what's in there. But I think the original idea we had was really to use fibroblasts as a third player. So the original version of this slide actually had a, a triangle, which is a different yeah. way to represent three types right. and how they move together. But the maths, it gets, um, it's not unique at some point. So we just gave up and went to two, but certainly one of our, our great idea or one of our, I think it's a great idea <laughs> is to, is to work toward more, more players and then the environment in particular. So adding fibroblasts, adding T cells and looking at them and tracking them in time. So yeah, great, okay. great plan, but it's uh, hard enough with just two and without. Yeah. I mean, the load Voltaire, it's just solving it and how do you solve it? The complexity is so crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, Dominic. Hey, fascinating stuff. I have a question about competition. You mentioned competition quite a bit, obviously, and, and, and uh, have competition is strongest in the constant population, right? If you, if you have a carrying capacity and, and, and the fitness effects come in very strongly. But a, a cancer is obviously not a constant population. It's, it, it's growing. If you've got exponential growth, there is virtually no competition because they just grow separately. If you've got spatial growth, which is more applicable, then there is maybe some competition when wild type kind of move around the, the mutants and, and block them. But if cells move around and this gets weaker, so 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 how does that come into in, into this sort of um, thinking and, and and modeling? Yeah, great question. So let me push back on one tiny part of it. So I think that a lot of us, me included, think about competition as something um, obviously for space, for carrying capacity, like you're saying, some sort of saturation effects. But there's other types of ecological interactions that don't require that especially if it's a secreted factor and whatnot. So I think that depending on the ecology that's going on, you could, I mean, in these experiments I showed, this is like very sparse. Like these things are not touching to begin with, but there's still some sort of, and I, I think the word competition is what's the, the loaded word. There's still some sort of ecological dynamic, one of which you might describe as competition, but there's other ecological dynamics at play that, that right. may or may not require different population levels, but absolutely a simplifying assumption of sort of normalizing growth to one is, is, a, is a bad one, but a required one for, for this tool. Um, right. Our Tim, who's smarter than me, um, than many people, um, has figured out how to prove some of these things in exponentially growing populations with unbounded growth, um, but, but it does get a little bit more complicated. Uh, and I think that, you know, maybe at some point, if you're talking about uh, saturation and spatially constrained models, maybe you move away from this formalism. Right. And I think sometimes that at the end of the day, it's not about the tool, it's about the question. So if the question can't be answered with this tool, right. maybe we just don't use it. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thanks so much. Cheers. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you so much for speaking.
Um, I'd like to, interrupt, <laughs> to uh, invite a close friend and mentor who I blame for my quitting residency, uh, David Basanta, to join us on the stage. Um, David's going to talk about an integrated game theoretical model describing tumor evolution dynamics. I sense a theme. Um, and I think, uh, you know, I, I did talk about David a whole bunch already, but I really do owe you a lot, my friend. Thank you so much for inviting me to your world. Um, don't waste it.